Okay, respected Kishila, Kishi Tawasumila, and uh, Venerable Elizabeth, Director and Venerable, and um, the, all my friends here. And in fact, um, it has been some years that I know um, Nico and um, Kavisina. Tibet House and in other places. So the, the talk that I have here is the how do we see the points of convergence and points of divergence within modern science and Buddhist philosophy. And um, at times it may become a little technical, um, but I will try my best. By the way, the same, anyone from university, anyone from university residence, university you are teaching or, or you are teaching or you are studying there, anyone? Okay, so basically why I'm asking this is, why I'm asking this is that to know, because this topic is a little technical, but to go into the say the Buddhist philosophy, which of course is very complicated, and then uh, quantum physics is going to be again complicated. Uh, so what I would do is that that I'll quickly go through and uh, even if it becomes technical, don't worry too much about that. So where necessary, I'll try to explain them in simple terms. So meanwhile, um, to the question answer session. In fact, I've told Nico that it is my experience the last the several years that during my usually the Westerners, it is and there there are so many questions coming up. But what I noticed was that that um, in Malaysia, in Singapore, in Vietnam, and in, also in other places. The questions at the end of the talk is much less. So therefore I'm expecting some questions from this group as well. So which I discussed with Nicola. Okay, so the so the point is that they say first of all, what is the approach of modern science and what is the approach of what is philosophy? And number one is what what is the approach? And number two, say what makes somebody to follow this approach, this question. So the Buddha said that mind is the chief and precedes them all. If it pure one, if it pure mind, one actually speaks, happiness will follow one like a car falling ox, falling ox. So what it is saying here, what the Buddha is saying here is that, that the finally, we want say okay the headphone is not working no no so here yeah, the, the microphone is working okay you switch okay okay so the point is that the Finally, the mind decides. Your mind decides whether you're happy, unhappy, and the happiness and the unhappiness, which we which we seek happiness, the suffering we we shun. These are all the results of our own mental thinking, mental thinking. So to go a little deeper, and the, how the mind interacts with the objects, interacts with the object. For example, say, when you see a beautiful flower, how your mind interacts? When you see undesirable things, how does your mind interact? So there, the interaction between your mind and the object, on that basis, then the various emotions arise. On that basis, then the feeling of the, the pleasant feeling, 
unpleasant feeling and the miseries, happiness, they all arise. So the Buddha said that finally it is all your mind. Your mind decides. So in the same token of thinking, Albert Einstein, Albert Einstein, um, he said something very similar. So before I go through this, I will summarize what Albert Einstein said. Of course, the first picture, it is Albert Einstein with um, Rabindranath Tagore, who is a Nobel laureate in literature, Indian, Indian Nobel laureate in literature, a great, great uh, Nobel laureate. And then the second picture, that is Albert Einstein giving his Nobel address. Nobel address. So what the Buddha said, what Albert Einstein said, we see that there's a, such a similarity between the two. Um, Albert Einstein, so while being a, say, the, a giant in physics, giant in academic physics, what he said is that Finally, all our problems, the problems the world is going through. For example, what is happening in Syria, what is happening in Iraq, what is happening in Myanmar, what is happening, wherever you go, all these problems, somehow they are all because of the, the, the a very narrow thinking, very narrow thinking that we have, I, you, and then we push others away from you, and we have a sense of a very narrow compassion, very sh short term compassion towards your near and dear ones. So we see that this narrowness Albert Einstein describes as the optical illusion. Seeing oneself, one, yourself, and your friends, relatives as something important, and all others, we push them aside. So this Einstein said is like, we are creating our own prison. 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 What does it mean by prison? Prison. I'm sure you'll agree with me. Prison is a place where you feel restricted, you feel constrained, and that you cannot go beyond a certain limit of the space. So, when we have a sense of self-cherishing, which is what Albert Einstein is saying, and then when you push others away from you, you're creating a prison for yourself. Prison, you push all others away from you. And then you and small circle becomes a very small area. Beyond this, you cannot go. Because the moment you go beyond this, you feel unhappy. So this is a prison created by us. So this he calls as the optical illusion, optical delusion. So unless we get rid of this, un unless we transcend the optical delusion, there is no way by which we can uh, get a genuine happiness. Okay, if I read this, a human being is a part of the whole, called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experience, experiences himself or, and he, his and her thoughts and feeling as something separate from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. Okay, so how to get out of this problem? He said, this delusion is like a prison for us, restricting us to a personal desires and affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. So this is what Albert Einstein said. So when we see what the Buddha said, what the Buddha taught, and what Albert Einstein said, when you compare the two things, we see that by no means there is any difference, it's just the same essence. So with this in mind, the next one, this is a very important point. Say if we're able to look at things in a, from a wider perspective, if we're able to look at things in a more, say, a sensible perspective, we see that, that all our miseries, unnecessary miseries will come to an end and we all will have a very harmonious, happy state of mind. So with this, what I'd like to share with you here is, this is what Aranigarjuna said. This is very important. And in turn, oftentimes, what I say is that um, the many people, many people, whether in the West, Europe, America, Asia, Australia, wherever you go, 
we see that there are a lot of people who are going into depression. And this is now uh, the increasing trend, a trend which is increasing in nature, depression. And this depression is all because of, say, the failing to, failing to address one's own mind, failing to control one's mind, administer one's mind. And of course, depression, there are several kinds. Some people, depression is more like genetic. If it is genetic, then of course we have to deal it separate. Otherwise, simply because of the, say, the inappropriate thinking, or say, the um, unwise way of thinking, then unless we go into depression. So for these, we need to keep in mind what Arunigarjuna said. What Arunigarjuna said is that, <clears throat> say, um, but we just raise your hands, those who have this, those who know what is, uh, what is gold, how the gold is extracted from gold ore. Anyone who knows, or any idea as to what gold ore is like, gold ore, gold and soil mixed. When you extract the gold, you see the gold and the, 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 the soil, these two are mixed together. They are not, you don't see the gold as something <coughs> yellow, glowing, you don't see it in its ore form. How many of you know that? Raise your hands. There is those so, who so have some idea as to as to what gold ore is like, gold mixed with soil, right? So the point is that that when you see the gold mixed with soil, mixed with soil, and the ordinary people like us, we don't believe we cannot believe that there's a gold there because it's just the ordinary soil. But in the eyes of the gold experts, it is not an ordinary soil. There's gold inside. There's gold inside. So the the gold experts, how do they prove that there's gold there is by removing the soil, removing the soil from the gold. As the soil is removed, then the gold inside will start to glow more and more. You agree with me? Good. Okay, so this is how deep inside the mind that we have, our mind, which is, we seems to be, at times we feel so low, we feel so depressed. And we feel sad, gloomy, particularly maybe in the winter. In the winter, when the when the the, the day days were short, rainy, cold, foggy, the mind is very depressed. How many of you How many of you have that experience? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we all have this experience, right? Our mind is very okay. The day is very short. In fact, I remember I was in England, two thousand three. Oh. At 3, 3.30, already it's dark. It's so gloomy. I finished my class. Then I have to take a bus. It's all pretty dark. All right? Okay. Very gloomy. So there, we think that our mind is gloomy. It is not. It is not. The gloominess that we feel is actually the, the, the soil. The soil mixed with the gold the gold is not visible you just see the the, the soil which is just ordinary likewise we see a mind is very gloomy it's not the, the true nature of mind it's not the true nature of mind what the gloominess that you see is like the soil mixed with the true nature of the mind true nature of the mind is so pure like the gold when you remove the soil more and more then the gold inside will glow it will glow okay so then we see that, wow, it's amazing. This gold is so pure, it is glowing, it's so beautiful. Likewise, the true nature of mind, each one of us, whether you're Buddhists, Christians, Jews, non-believers, it doesn't matter. Our mind, the true nature of mind is just the same. It is as pure, it is as pure as the, the Buddha's mind. So um, they say, let's say that, let me give you an example of a, a, say a diamond a diamond say a diamond which is extremely clean pure and displayed in the diamond uh, the shop diamond shop and another diamond which just you picked up from the, the garbage from a ditch is very dirty smelly right so, and both of them, same weight, same weight, 
Which of the two diamond is more precious? Tell me. Which of the two diamond is more expensive? The diamond that you find in the the shop and the same quality, right? Uh, you know, same quality. One in the shop, one you find from the ditch, but it's very, it's not very dirty. Which of the two is more expensive? Just tell me. Huh? Okay, from the shop. Okay, which means that you are not a diamond seller. <laughs> a diamond seller will not sell this dirty diamond even for one cent less. For him, he will just clean this up and again put it in the shop. There is no difference for a diamond expert. But for the ordinary people, there is a difference. right? So the point is that our mind is like the diamond that you find in the ditch. Inside is so pure. right? The dirt is just a superficial outside. Whereas the, the, dim, the, the diamond that you find in the shop is like the Buddha's mind, which is so pure. So what's the difference? Just the superficiality. There's a difference in the superficiality. So inside is just the same. So don't think that, okay, he's there, he's just talked something to nice. No, this is the reality that we have to discover. That we all have the same Buddha nature. Buddha's mind, your mind, Deep inside, there's no difference. Both are very pure diamonds. The only difference is that the mind that we have is obscured by the metal dirt. Like the diamond that you find from the ditch is obscured by the, 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 the filth, superficial filth. You remove the filth, the diamond inside is so pure. Okay, so this is what Arunigarjuna said here. And from this point of view, what I would say is that if you discover if you discover that you have this irrespective of what religion that you're following, it doesn't matter whether you're following Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Jainism, or non-believer, it doesn't matter. The mind that you have, the true nature of mind is so pure. This is what we need to um, <coughs> understand. For example, let's say, let's say the, in France, or which month is hottest? Hey. France, which month is hottest? July, August. Huh? August. July. July, August, let's say. July, August. It's so hot. And then we are all, we are all, we are all waiting for, what? We are all waiting for, to get form, to get the, to buy the iPhone, iPhone 10 plus. iPhone 10. Right? To buy iPhone 10, we are all trying to get the new piece. I'm lining up outside. Outside. In the scorching sun, we are all very thirsty, right? So I take this, I take a glass of water from the uh, Seine River, River Seine, from the I take the water, and you are all very thirsty. Do you like to drink it? No. No, you don't want to drink it. Why do you don't want to drink it? Why not? Because it is dirty. Okay, now what I do is that I subject this water, this water from the Seine River. I subject it to the purification purification process, reverse osmosis, ultra filtration. I subject this water to all the purification processes. Then finally, it becomes very clean. Okay, now do you want to drink it? Yes. All the water that you get from the, sh the, the shops, they are like this, <laughs> right? They are purified. Okay, now tell me, why don't why? Okay, tell me. So why do you want to drink the, the water after the purification? Answer is very simple. Why? Because it is clean. You agree with me? Now tell me, this clean water, this pure water, it came from where? It came from the dirty Seine War River or it came from Himalaya from Himalaya. From where did it from where did this water come from where did it come? Huh? From where? From the same dirty water. You're getting it from the same dirty water. Okay. Now tell me. This is one example. The dirty water. The dirty water that I extract from the river Seine. Right? Seine. Very dirty. But through purification processes, it becomes very pure. Now, on the other hand, let me give an example of, say, a black charcoal. How many of you... I'm just wondering, how many of you have actually seen a black charcoal? Raise your hands. Black charcoal. How many of you have seen black charcoal? Okay, so many they might have seen. Some of you have seen that. Black charcoal, if I assign you to make it white, if I assign you to make it white, what will you do? You'll remove the black part. 
Remove the black part, what happened to the, the charcoal? Tell me. Any idea? What happened to charcoal if I remove the black part? Huh? The charcoal will disappear, it will vanish, it will disappear. Right? With the dirty water, by removing the dirt, the water did not disappear. The black charcoal removed the black part, the charcoal disappears. Tell me what's the difference. Why? Why in the case of the dirty water, the same, same river, water from the same river, why when you remove the dirt, instead of it disappearing, it becomes so pure, one. Black charcoal, why, instead of becoming white, the charcoal disappears, why? What's the difference between these two things? Anyone? Anyone? Very quick. You can speak in French, you can speak in English, whatever you like. Give an example, yeah, give me an answer. It's the nature of charcoal to be black. Very good. So in the case of the water, dirty water, however dirty the water is, just see whether you agree with me or not. However dirty the water is, the true nature of the water is not dirty. The black charcoal, the true nature of the, the intrinsic nature, the true nature, intrinsic nature of the charcoal is black. So when you remove the black part, you are removing the true nature. But the true nature is removed, the charcoal disappears. Whereas in the case of dirty water, when you remove the, the dirt, you are not removing the true nature. You are removing the adventitious nature. If you remove the adventitious nature, what is left? True nature is left. What is the true nature of the water? What is the true nature of the water? Purity. Perfect purity. So when you remove the dirt, the perfect pu purity comes out. Right? So our mind, luckily, fortunately, our mind is not like the dirty, the, it's not like the black charcoal. Fortunately, however dirty our mind is, our mind is like the dirty water from Seine River. It is like a dirty water, it's not like the black charcoal. However dirty our mind is, the true nature of mind is never dirty. It is so pure. So with this mind, what is very important in our life, and I would say that through you, I would, I would say let your friends, your friends, the people who you know, to know that finally the true nature of your mind, whether you're a believer or not believer, whether you're Buddhist or not Buddhist, it doesn't matter. True nature of your mind is so pure. So pure, characterized by three natures. Perfect love, perfect knowledge, and perfect power. So this is what our true nature of mind is. But why our mind is not so pure now? Why don't, why don't I see this as so pure now? Because that is defined by the metal stains. You're getting it? Okay, so this is what we have to know. With this in mind, okay, tell me. So if this is how I present the, the talk, so what could be your next question? I said that the true nature of mind is very pure, but our mind is not pure as yet. It is it's very dirty, it is, say, the unhappy, Particularly Monday mornings. Monday morning, what is our mind like? <laughs> Any idea? <laughs> okay, Monday morning, you're getting it? Okay, so Friday evenings, um, everybody, the face glows. And on Monday morning, everybody is so <laughs> gloomy. Okay, so this is, this tells us what our mind is like. What our mind is like? Never mind. What I said is that true nature of mind is forever glowing. True nature of mind, whether you're a believer or non-believer, whether you're a girl or whether you're male or female, whether you're old or young, right? It doesn't matter. We are all just the same. The true nature of nature mind is so pure, right? Okay, if I say this, then what could be your next question to me? Anyone? How to purify the mind. Huh? How can we purify, How can we purify the mind? Very good. So the question is, if this is the reality, then how one, how can you remove the, how can you remove this, the metal dirt? This question, you're getting it? Okay, for that matter, okay, this is extremely important. Structure of the Buddha's teachings, it says the, the mantra, most of you know this mantra, Tiyatha, Gati Gati, Paragati, Parasamgati Bodhiswaha. Okay, so this mantra, so while we speak about this as a mantra, speak as a mantra, 
it is actually extremely, extremely, uh, the, what do you call it, a very secular, say, presentation. For example, say, when I was in class 11, high school, I learned this equation. Okay, I hope you all, you all agree with me, or you all know the same equation. E equals mc square. How many of you heard this equation before while you were in school? E equals mc square. How many? Just raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, all of us. Okay, let's say E equals mc square. So this is not a mantra. Why this is not a mantra? This is something which can derive, which we can derive from many facts. Likewise, this mantra, which we call as mantra, the Atha, I'm, I, I'm not going to explain in detail, so very likely for the retreat from tomorrow, I'm going to explain this in more detail. Retreat, where is this happening? Sat? Sat. Sankom. Okay, Sat, right? So there we're going to have this retreat, so all this detailed explanation will be explained there. Okay, so the point is that who cannot join us there, don't worry, I hope there's going to be recording. You can listen to recordings of this. Okay. So the point is that this mother is a very secular, very secular. It is not really, if you really say, look at the, the meaning of this mantra, you see this very secular in nature. And it is amazing thing that what he's saying is that the miseries, the pains, the stress, the tension that we're going through, they are, they are not your true nature. Your true nature is forever happy by nature. It, it is not visible because it is obscured by the metal defilements. You're getting it? Okay. Now with this, okay, just see what I'm doing. Just see what I'm doing. What did I do? I clam. Okay. Say the, the miseries that we go through, the pains that we go through, stress that we go through, depression, the pain of losing near and dear ones. All these pains, they are, they are, they are the, they are analogous to the sound of this clam, this clam. Just as this sound, which is analogous to the, all the miseries that we go through, just as this sound comes into being by the combination of two hands, right hand, left hand. All our miseries come into being by the combination of external factors and internal factors. Right? Okay, say, say, uh, I don't know how, how true that is in the case of uh, France, right? Say, your neighbor. Okay, say, let's say. Uh, what I said is that this, the sound of the clap is because of the two hands coming together. And the two hands, they symbolize external factors and the internal factors. You're getting it? For example, say, oh, this morning, this afternoon, I went to the, what, the uh, River Seine, right? To look at the various monuments. And it was very hot. It was scorching, very hot, right? It's very hot. Okay, we never said, we never said that, oh, my body, my body so weak, it cannot bear the heat. We never say this, we blame the outside. It's very hard. This is how we say this, right? Okay. So of the two hands, external, we always look for the external to blame for our problems, right? But the reality is that this sound should it should come only by the combination of the external and the internal too. It is not always one side, right? Okay. Let's say, tell me, how many of you, when you're by yourself, you feel very lonely? Raise your hands. If you if you have a, if you're very young, you can complain to your mother, mother, I'm so lonely. <laughs> Dad, I'm so lonely. Right? If you're with other people, again you will complain. I have no privacy. <laughs> right? This is reality. Say <coughs> external factor with your, if you're by yourself or if you're with other people, there's a problem. So the external, there's no choice. Either you should be by yourself or you should be with somebody. Right, this is the only choice. But now, where are the problems coming? Problems coming because of, because you are with other people or because we are by yourself? It's the sound. 
like the sound coming into being because of the, the two factors. <coughs> two factors. You're getting it? Whereas external factors, okay, so we often blame the external factors, right? In the winters, when you go out, you have to put on the very thick jacket, go, right? Before you get into the metro, before you get into the, the, the taxi, whatever, right? It's very cold. Oh, and the winter is so long. How long is the winter? Very much. Huh? Almost. <laughs> Almost. Three months. Three months. Three months, right? Very long winter. Right, okay. Okay. So the point is that, the point is that external factors. So, in the winters when it feels so cold outside, not inside, outside, right? I want to go around, I cannot go around, it's so cold. The point is external factors. External factors, finally tell me, what do you want? Right? Don't forget it. Finally, what do you want? I want to just freely go around Paris, not confined in a house. Okay. So this is what I like to do. Okay. So with this, the point is that the external factors, external factors, so the sound of clam with the say that the problem which arise which arise because of the two factors, external and internal. External factors, how many such external factors are the air? How many such external factors are the air? Just raise your hands, tell me. Ten. Ten external factors? Ten is easy. You can remove that. Ten, twenty, hundred, infinite. Infinite external factors of the air. Infinite external factors of the air. So therefore, but we are so addicted to pointing out to the external factors. Right? Blaming external factors. It's fine. It's not. Some people say that, oh, it is just purely mine, purely mine. That is also not true. We should be very realistic. We should be very realistic. What I'm saying is that, the problems arise because of two factors, external and internal. It is not always internal, it is not always external. Okay, one. Now, external factors, external factors, right? Say, for example, if there is a poisonous tree growing, growing there, poisonous tree, and the leaves, there are millions of poisonous leaves, and the wind blows, and the wind hits your body, it, it creates skin rashes. Skin rashes. Oh, this is because of this poisonous leaf. You go and remove the re leaves one by one. You remove like 100 leaves. In the next two days, 400 new leaves will grow. Right? So this is not wise. This is not wise. Okay. Now the point is that the external factors, how many such external factors are there? Innumerable ex ex external factors are there. And infinite, even what we consider as, as the conducive factors, they are also non-conducive factors. For example, what I, the example that I give you, when you are by yourself, you say that I am very lonely. When you are with other people, you say that I have no privacy. So external factors, these, these two are the, the two things that you have to be in one of the two factors, either by yourself or with other people. Likewise, there are so many incredibly infinite number of external factors there. So it is, if you think very sens sensibly, it is actually literally, literally, literally impossible to get rid of all external factors. You agree with me? Or if you agree with me, I'll go to the next step. Do you agree with me? Yes. Very good. Okay. If you agree with me that the number of the external factors is infinite, infinite, and internal factors is also there, Right now, imagine that if you remove the internal factors, external factors, right, very strong external factors, but the sound stops. You agree with me? Good. Now, from this, what we've learned is that external factors, the number is innumerable and infinite. If you think of removing the external factors, it is not really wise. What is wise is finally what you what you want is external factors, internal factors is not important. What is important that the sound of the misery should stop. You agree with me? As long as the sound of the misery stops, that's fine. For example, Buddha appeared, Buddha appeared 2500 years ago. 
He did not remove all the external factors. You agree with me? Then Jesus Christ came 2,000 years, 2,000 years ago. He did not remove all the external factors. You agree with me? Then about like how many years, Prophet Muhammad? 1600. 1600 years ago, right? Prophet Muhammad came. He could not remove all the external factors. Yes, no? Yes. Good. But they taught us one thing. They taught us how to get into the internal factors. Right? Okay. So therefore, our job is finally, you can reduce the external, remove the external factors. You can remove the internal factors. Up to you. But the point is that you do it in a such way that your misery should stop. You agree with me? If you agree with me, if you agree with me, right? So you remove the external factors or you remove the internal, whatever you do, do something, do something and remove your miseries. The sound of the misery should stop, right? Say right hand, you stop it, the sound stops. Or left hand, you stop and then the, the right hand is there, sound stops. Sound of the misery is what disturbs you. So your job is to eradicate the sound of the clan. So for that matter, right, which is more sensible? To remove the external factor or to remove the internal factor? Which is more sensible? Tell me. Anyone? Internal factor. Very good. Okay. So this is the success of our talk. Right? The next question. If this is what we have concluded, tell me, what could be your next question to me? So what we have decided thus far is that External factors are involved, internal factors are involved to, like the sound of clamp, to give rise to the sound of the miseries. If you don't want the miseries, either get rid of the external factors or get rid of the internal factors. This is what you've learned. Having learned this, the next question is, which is more sensible? To get rid of external factors, to get rid of internal factors, right? So what we said is that to get rid of the internal factors, it is more sensible. Okay, if this is our... Thus far, the conclusion, what could be your next question to me? So that I can go, the, I can continue my talk. Anyone? Uh? Okay, very good question. <laughs> okay. Perhaps, or oh, anyone else? Anyone else? Do you have any other question? Say, what I'm saying, not just any question, right? Don't, uh, don't ask me, well, how is that the, the, the new Prime Minister? <laughs> don't ask me this question, right? What, what I'm saying is, ask me a question, where the point we have reached thus far. From there, what could be the next question that can connect me to the next point that I have to, uh, the, that I deliver the talk? But the one question is, how can we get rid of the internal factors? Anyone, any, any other, the, is there other questions that you might have? Maybe some other forms of the question. Anyone? What is the source of those internal How to avoid those internal factors? Okay, same. How to avoid internal factors? How to get rid of internal factors? Is the same question. Anyone else? Okay, do you agree with me that because the, the France is very the word the very developed, so you jumped one question, right? One question is, yes. What are internal factors? Thank you. <laughs> right, okay. What are the internal factors? One, then how to get rid of the internal factors? You're getting it? This is extremely important, right? So we need to know, particularly learning Buddhist philosophy, it is so important, particularly learning Buddhist philosophy, one, learning Buddhist philosophy, and applying this to your own day-to-day -day life, how to make it relevant to your day-to-day -day life, that is determined by how you are able to relate this philosophy to your life by knowing what precise questions to ask. So the question is, one, what are the internal factors? Number two, once having identified what the internal factors are, how to get into the internal factors? These two questions, you're getting it? Okay, now let's go to this mantra. <coughs> Tiyatha gade gade para gade para samgade bodhiswaha. Right? So here, gade gade in English it is go, go, go beyond, go utterly beyond, and establish your enlightenment, establish your ultimate happiness. This is the meaning. 
so what it is saying is that go go what go go from the state of go from the state of unhappiness to the state of the ultimate happiness state of unhappiness state of misery to the state of ultimate happiness you're getting it so how many things are there gate gate paragate parasamgate bodhi so how many how many points are there five <laughs> these are known as the five parts five parts meaning the five stages through which your mind can be purified of the internal factors you're getting it the five stages through which your mind can be purified of the external the internal factors okay so for that for that and he say now do you agree with me the point is that as we as i give the talk that you should i want you should be that you to be actively involved with what we, we we're doing is going it's going to be more like an interactive session right so my my point to you is that do you agree with me thus far that okay if there is a way by which i can number one identify the internal factors number two if i learn if i know how to remove the internal factors then i will apply it to my mind and then slowly i can remove the metal dirts one by one so the mind becomes cleaner 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 you agree with me okay if you agree with me here then the state of the mind that we have now this is the the basis the basis the reality that we are the reality that we live in now the basis so from this we are going to total total perfection diamond very dirty diamond we're going to make it a very clean diamond so making the clean diamond this is the goal this result clean diamond is the result and the the basis the reality that we are now the unclean diamond you're getting it unclean diamond that we have the basis from there we're going to go to the very clean diamond to make it very clean diamond so the process which connects the two is the path you're getting it okay if you want to go to india to have to receive teachings from his holiness the dalai lama so how do you do the, hey, the, the france people how do you do uh, you first buy flight ticket <laughs> right okay you have to, to buy a flight ticket so you are in france this is the basis from the and the goal is you want to go to dharamsala or india right that is the goal so what connects you the flight that takes you there that is the path you're getting it the basis the result and the path the basis is where we are now from this we have to start so the mantra says gate gate para gate para samgate bursa in english go 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 beyond go utterly beyond and establish your ultimate happiness so ultimate happiness is the the clean, very clean diamond and go from the unclean from the impure state from the misery from there you go towards happiness this is understanding okay for this for this okay so don't forget this the basis path and the result now buddhism is science modern science and buddhism modern science and buddhism two of them agree two of them converge pertaining to the first point which is the basis to to identify what the reality is what the reality is that we will live in so they are buddhism and modern science converge these two converge whereas modern science modern science does not talk about the path it does not talk about the result whereas buddhism talks about the path and result on top of the basis okay so now the, the next is the basis where we are now there is the, the the reality that we are now right for example just imagine if you don't know the reality then you cannot create a proper path for example let's say that we are in a very in france is there any place which is a very rocky bumpy place is there any place in france Plateau de Milas. Okay, Plateau de Milas. Right. So we are going to Plateau de Milas, and then I have no idea what Plateau de Milas is. Right. So he said that. Okay. Then we. I said that 
Okay, so we'll all go to Plato de Milas. Right? So what do we do is that, how far is it from here? Huh? 500 kilometers. So therefore we have to take a car. We'll take a limousine car. We'll take a limousine car, right? Limousine car. Limousine car, then going the air, we got stuck there. Because it's Bombay Road. Rocky, right? So the limousine car doesn't work. Why? Why we cannot work beyond that? Because I do not know the reality of Plasid The reality of Plasid is not smooth place. It's a very bumpy place. So, if we know the reality, on that basis, then we will take up the, the relevant car. A car which is suitable. I'll not take limousine. I'll take the Jeep. You agree with me? Okay. So, for that, the basis, meaning the reality, if you don't know the reality, then you cannot really create the path. If you don't create the path, you cannot reach the destination or your goal. Okay. For that matter, the question is what's the reality? The reality is something that we cannot believe. The reality is something which is to be objectively real. Objective real. So therefore, modern science emphasizes so much on what is known as objectivity of the phenomena. We should be very objective in a pursuit of the pursuit of the studies. Objective the pursuit. That is so much emphasized in modern science. Buddhism also emphasized so much on exploring the objective reality there. We are not to base our ideas, theology on the basis of the blind faith. So therefore in Buddhism there is no basis for blind faith. Okay. It was back in 2003 when I was first in England, in Cambridge. I was there in Cambridge for Cambridge University for about like two and a half months there. Then the because of my my fondness, my fondness, my liking for physics, I meet with number of physicists. Okay, and um, in fact, before I became monk, I was in high school. I was in high school, and my high school, I was so fond of physics and mathematics. And the, I think the, the final year of high school, I dropped biology. I dropped biology. And actually, the second final year, I was, I was doing pretty good in physics, mathematics, chemistry, and biology as well. And the class, the final year, I dropped biology. And my biology teacher was very upset. My biology teacher was very upset. And she persuaded the mathematics teacher to, to tell this boy to, to continue with the biology. <laughs> so, but I did not, right? Okay, so I was thinking of actually pursuing physics as my major after my schooling. Okay, whatever is the case, don't ask me why not physics now. Right, this is a long story. Okay, now the point was that when I was in Cambridge, Cambridge University, I met with one extremely brilliant physicist and a physicist he was extremely brilliant and you cannot talk to him because you say something he will say that there's internal contradiction what are you saying there's internal contradiction right it's so difficult to talk to him because he's very bright what he sees the, the moment you talk to him he can see your internal contradiction so therefore, people find it very difficult to talk to him. Okay, so two of us, we were talking. And then, finally he said one thing which is very upsetting for all of us. Okay, tell me, raise your hands who are, who are from physics background in your university level. Raise your hands. No one from physics background. Okay, now if, you, if there's no one from physics background, listen what he said. Right, it's very, it's very disheartening. What he said is that, in this world, only physics is education. Okay, how many of you are from physics education? <laughs> no, including me. No. Right? I said, why? Why only physics education? He said, okay, listen, this is what he said. Only physics allows you to have a critical thinking. All others are imitation of the earlier teachers. This is what he said. Right? Okay, so... I said, okay, if this is the reason, then I'm happy. Then I told him, listen what the Buddha has to say. So, 
this, the Buddha said, O oh, monks and the wise people, just as a goldsmith tests the purity of the gold by cutting, rubbing, and burning gold, you should also examine my words and put them to practice, not simply because you respect me. Right? Okay, this is what I told him. Then he sat silent for two seconds. Then he said, Oh, the Buddha must have been a great physicist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so basically this is something which is, this is the strength of the Buddha's teaching. This is the strength of the Buddha's teaching. Seeing that we have to, we are not to follow, blind, follow the Buddha blindly. Just make sure that we analyze what he taught and if through your analysis, only then you have to accept what he said, otherwise not. This is his very strong message and which this is something which the, in the beginning opening passage of Buddhism and opening passage of modern science, this is where the two meet, the two meet to do for the objectivity, to resort, to, dip, to rely on reasoning and rationality. This is so precious. Okay. So these, the four things, I may not go in detail here, what the Buddha taught. All composite things are impermanent. All contaminated things of suffering nature. Everything is of nature or emptiness, selflessness. Transcending soul is absolute peace. Okay, these are known as the the four the 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 what the four seals of the Buddha's teachings, right? So if you look at this, we see that there are so many parallels between Buddhism and modern science. First one, all composite things are impermanent. What the, the what the contemporary science, particularly physics, particularly physics and chemistry as well. When they look at how things, composite things, which are composed of particles, in terms of the physics, for the physics, they don't speak about mind. The, what is composed of the particles, what is composed of electrons, protons, neutrons, and so forth, they see that they are just in constant, constant wave of the fluctuations. Right? That is impermanent. So this is what the Buddha taught. All composite things are impermanent. Number one. Number two, all contaminated things are suffering. Of course, this is what is more related to what is known as the path and the, the result. And number three, everything is of the nature of emptiness and selflessness. Point number three, this is extremely important. Finally, the Buddha said, okay, you asked me the question, what is the nature of the internal factors? And how to get into the internal factors? This is what you've asked me, right? So the Buddha indicated, we are going to learn a little detail later on, but if, as of now, the, what the Buddha taught is that finding all our problems, internal factor is ignorance. Ignorance is the internal factor which is responsible for all our problems. This is what the Buddha said. Right? What is this ignorance? What is this ignorance? This ignorance. Okay, let's see. Okay, let's see. How many of you have dreamt of being chased by a ghost in your life? Just raise your hands. How many of you have dreamt of being chased by a ghost in your life? At least once. Raise your hands. One. Myself too. Oh, French, you don't dream. <laughs> huh? You dream, right? Did you ever dream of a, did you ever have a nightmare in your dream? Huh? Just raise your hands. Okay, you have nightmare. Okay, somebody likes to share with us what kind of nightmare? Because for us, it's more like the, the ghost. <laughs> ghost nightmares. The French, what is the nightmare like? Is there anyone who likes to share with us? What kind of nightmare dream? Anyone? Just share with us. Anyone? Yes. No, you can speak in French. I don't know. Okay. If it's confidential, don't worry. <laughs> right. So whatever you like to share with us? Yes. Seeing my wife dancing with another man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, this is between you and your wife. Okay. Anyone else? Any other dream? Anyone? 
some yeah. some serial killer in the street with a gun shooting everybody. Oh. Did you really dream of that? <laughs> oh. Okay. So let's say let's say let's say that let's say let's say that you're dreaming. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll have to check this. Say when you were young, age six, seven, eight, nine, below ten. So there, how many of you dreamt of having fallen from a cliff? One. Okay, okay. Let's say, let's say that that we were dreaming of climbing a cliff, climbing a cliff, right? Climbing a cliff, and then you're on the verge to fall, on the verge to fall, and then you fall, right? And what is it feeling like, right? What is it feeling like? Hey, tell me. Very scary. Very scary. So much of fear, right? Okay. So, when you're falling in the air, it is so from the air, right? And then on the, on the worst to collapse, right? So there, then your mother wakes you up. Before you actually hit the ground, your mother wakes you up. What is the feeling? <sighs> what a relief. You're getting it? Okay, tell me. Okay. Okay. Right? Okay, by the way, how many of you like cheesecakes? <laughs> okay, good. That, that may be better. Right? Okay, let's say. Let's say that. Okay. Say. This is very important. Very important. Say. You're fast asleep. And then you start to, you start to have a dream. And the dream is that. It is your birthday. It is your birthday in the dream. But nobody came to greet you. Are you happy or not happy? Very sad, very unhappy. Right? And then finally, it's already, say, 2 p.m. Nobody came to greet you. Finally, 2, 2 p.m., your mother came with a big cheesecake. With a big cheesecake. Are you happy or not happy? Very happy. Okay. And then next to the mother is a cat. There's a cat. Usually the cat is very cute. Now today the cat jumps on the cake <laughs> and top of the cake. Right? What is your reaction? Very angry. Right? Very upset. So angry. Okay, this is a simple example, but it's an incredible. If you can understand this fully, this is a final panacea, the final medicine to remove all your fears of life. Tell me. Say, when your mother brings the cheesecake, right, just for you, your birthday, are you very happy or not? Huh? Yes. Very happy. The next moment, the cat jumps on it and topples the cake. What's your state? Very unhappy. You're getting it? Which of the two, which of the two part of the dream? You like? You see the cheesecake? Or the, 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 the cat jumps on the cheesecake? Which do you prefer? Which one? Everybody, my second question. How many of you are going to have this dream tonight? How many of you are going to have this dream tonight? Why not? Why not? <laughs> Tell me, why not? Give me the answer. Why not? Nobody raise hand. Why not? Tell me. 
Exactly. The dream is not in your hand. You're getting it? The dream is not in your hand. So, dream is not in your hand, and the dream dictates what you should do in the dream. You're getting it or not? The dream dictates. It's a pleasant dream, nice dream, you're very happy. If you have a very scary dream, you have so much of fear, right? So the dream dictates whether you are happy or unhappy. You don't, you cannot, uh, you don't have the freedom to choose a dream. You agree with me or not? Okay. If you don't have the freedom to choose a dream, this is known as the loss of the freedom. You agree with me or not? Loss of freedom is misery. You agree with me or not? Misery is samsara. You agree with me or not? So finally, what is samsara? There is no external samsara. It is the loss of the freedom of your mind. Right? This is so important. If you know this, right, tell me. Now, in which of the two cases the dream is not in your hand? The mother bringing the cheesecake or the cat jumping on the cheesecake? Which of the two dreams you don't have the freedom? Both. You're getting it? So these two dreams, although one is very pleasant, but one is unpleasant, but do both have one thing in common, that you don't have the freedom to choose. If you don't have the freedom to choose, even if it's a very pleasant dream, even if it's a pleasant dream, but you don't have the freedom. Loss of freedom is misery. Even if it's a pleasant dream, you don't have the freedom. Loss of freedom is misery. Misery is samsara. Right? This is so important. Now tell me, Tell me. Okay. If you don't if you don't want this loss of freedom, what should you do? If you don't want this loss of freedom in the dream, what should you be doing? Anyone? Wake up. Wake up. Right? If you don't want, if you don't want to have this uh, loss of freedom in the dream. Why should you make the dream dictate you? Why should you make, why should you let them make the, the dictate or make you a puppet? In a dream you are a puppet. You agree with me? That, that the mother brings the, the cheesecake is not a real cheesecake. Right? And you are so excited. You are like a puppet. And then the, the cat jumps on it. There is no real cat jumping. And your dreams create a cat jumping on it. And you feel so angry. Again you are a puppet. Who made you a puppet? The dream. The dream is not in your hand. So you are like a puppet. If you don't want to be a puppet, puppet means loss of freedom. Puppet doesn't have the freedom. If you don't want the freedom, if you don't want the loss of the freedom, what should you do? Wake up. Right? So therefore, the Buddha, the Buddha is referred to as the fully awakened one. Right? Okay. With this, tell me, the two dreams, when one, one, the mother bringing the cheesecake to you, you're so happy, and the one, the cat jumping on the, the cheesecake, these two dreams, there is one thing, one thing in common. What is that? Huh? <laughs> okay, one thing, one thing, one thing common between these two. <laughs> oh, cheesecake. Okay. There's one thing which is common between these two things. Tell me. Anyone? Very quick. This is very important. Tell me. Anyone? Both are dreams. Exactly. Both are dreams. You're getting it? Okay. Now tell me. Okay. Where's the flower? It's here. Okay. <laughs> okay, tell me. Say, what is in my left hand? Flower. Yellow flower. What is in my right hand? Nothing. Huh? Nothing is there. Okay, imagine a blue flower. Imagine a blue flower in my right hand. Tell me, what is in my left hand? Yellow flower. Yellow flower. What is in my right hand? <laughs> French people see a blue flower here, <laughs> right? It's this imaginary blue flower. It's not a blue flower, right? It's an imaginary blue flower. Okay, no. so now tell me, what is the difference between these two flowers? One, the yellow flower in my left hand, 
and the other the imaginary blue flower in my left right hand what's the difference between these two flowers anyone this is extremely important not difficult oftentimes people say that emptiness is a very difficult concept it is not right just give me an answer what's the difference speak your mind there's no hard and fast rule there's no the, the, the stating the hard and fast answer right just tell me what is in your mind so what is the difference between these two flowers yellow flower in my left hand and an imaginary blue flower in my right hand just speak your mind tell me what's the difference anyone one is real the other same. Is not. one is real okay same there is no only one answer there could be many answers you're getting it you can speak from any for example say tell me what am i doing what am i doing i'm drinking what water some may say that you are drinking h2o right some may say that you are drinking water and some of you, some of you will say that you are drinking h2o some of you may be saying that you are drinking electrons protons neutrons <laughs> yes yes okay so there are three different oh, this they, they, they are not the same answer they are different answers likewise What's the difference between these two flowers? One answer is that one is real, one is not real. Okay, any other answers? Anyone? Huh? The color. The color. What's the color? The one in my left hand is yellow, and the one in my right hand is blue. Wow, the French. I see a blue flower. There's no flower there. If there's no flower, how can you speak about the color of the flower? Well, the French people see blue flower. Huh? Okay, <laughs> so there one doesn't have color, right? What's imaginary color? Imaginary color is not a color. Okay, tell me what's the difference? Anyone? Tell me one I see, one I don't see. One I can see, other I cannot see. You're getting it? Okay, tell me. How many of you have watched a movie in a movie theater? Big movie theater. Okay, okay. Tell me. Say you are watching a movie here. You are watching a movie here. Tell me where is this movie coming from? From where? From the projector. Where's the, where's the projector? Behind you. You're getting it. This is a very important concept. I'm I'm sharing with you. You are seeing a movie on the screen. Where is the movie coming from? From the projector. So screen is object. You're getting it. The flower. Flower is object. And your mind is the subject. You're getting it? Okay. Imagine blue flower is the object. And your mind thinking about the imagine blue flower is the subject. You agree with me? Very good. So this yellow flower. Okay. This yellow flower exists from, it exists from the object or from the subject? Yellow flower. Don't think that you're philosophers. you ordinary people. Just tell me. This yellow flower exists from the object or from the subject? Okay, okay, my question. Imaginary blue flower, mm -hmm. you are thinking about it? It's coming from your subject or it's coming from the, the flower? The subject. It's the subject. Whereas this flower is coming from the object. You're getting it? So in a loose sense, without being introduced to philosophy, in a loose sense say, this flower exists from the object, this flower objectively exists, and the imaginary blue flower subjectively exists. You agree with me? You get it? You agree with me? Okay, now tell me. that. This flower and the dream flower. Dream flower exists. Dream flower objectively exists or subjectively exists? Subjectively. Subjectively exists. Right? Okay. Now, dream flower objectively it exists or not exists? Huh? No. It does not exist. It exists subjectively. Okay. Okay. This flower is there. Right? And then this flower like this. Then what I do, I pick this flower up and say that, oh, this is mine. You're getting it? This flower is mine. Okay, the French people tell me, what, is, what do you understand by this? I said that this flower is mine. What do you understand by this? Huh? What do you understand by this? Huh? Okay, do you agree with me? When I say this flower is mine, it is a nice way of saying it is not yours. <laughs> Right? When I say that this flower is mine, it is a nice way of saying it is not yours. You agree with me? 
So when I say that, if I say that, they say, oh no, this is not yours, this is, this is mine, this is not yours. It's very offensive. Right? When I say, oh this is mine, it's a nice way of saying to not to offend you, at the same time to tell that this is not yours. Likewise, mine equivalent to subjective, yours equivalent to objective. The dream flower exists objectively or subjectively? The dream flower exists objectively or subjectively? Subjectively. subjectively. When you say that dream flower exists subjectively, what are you saying? You are saying that objectively it is empty. You're getting it? So when I say this is mine, I'm saying it is not yours. Not. Not and empty means the same. Likewise, the dream flower is coming from the subject, not from the object. It exists subjectively means it is empty of objective existence. You agree, you agree with me? Okay. So when you say the flower is empty of objective existence, this is the meaning. If it is empty of objective, if it is empty of objective, then the flower becomes like a dream. Dream is objectively empty. It's all coming from the subject. You're getting it? So therefore the flower becomes the flower becomes like a dream. Okay, now tell me. Tell me. Say. Say. In your dream. In your dream. Say the a ghost chase you in the dream. A ghost chase you in the dream. So what is your feeling? What's your feeling? So much of fear and you feel scared, right? And in the dream you you fall. And the, the ghost will not stop. The ghost will chase you even more. Right? More? And the ghost is about to grab at you. What is your feeling? So much of fear, right? And suddenly your father comes. No. Suddenly, okay, your father comes. Your father comes and says, Hey, what happened? Hey, what happened to you? So much fear. Oh, the ghost is coming. Right? And then your father says, Don't worry. I'll call Kishila. <laughs> right? I'll call Kishila. To the institute. Tapas Yundula. comes and says, Oh, money, pay me home. Right? And then the ghost retreats. The ghost retreats. What do you treat? And then your father tells you, hey, Are you happy now? I'm very happy. Thank you. Can I leave now? Can I leave now? He said, okay, fine. Then Gishila says, can I, can, can I leave now? Can you leave? Can I leave you now? Yes. Then Gishila, your father leaves. Again, the door goes, comes back. <laughs> okay. Right? So, Gishila performing the mantra, Om Mani Pemeh Hum. And the ghost disappearing. This is just a temporary, temporary relief. You agree with me? Hey, you agree with me? If you want a permanent relief, what should you do? If you want a permanent relief, what should you do? Call Gishira at home. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> huh? Call Gishira at home. <laughs> no, you're outside. <laughs> oh, what should you do? Understand that it's a dream. Oh, you should understand this dream is dream. In the dream, even if somebody is like, don't worry, this is not a ghost, this is a dream, you will not believe. <laughs> right? Okay, so in the dream, what? You have the? You need to have the same power as the Gishira. Okay, same power as the Gishira, right? <laughs> okay, and then the, the dream, the, the ghost calls a, another stronger ghost, <laughs> more, more powerful than Gishira. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, let's say. Now tell me, what, what is your name? Francoise. Huh? Francoise. 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 Okay, say so what Francoise said, right? You have to know that it is dream, which means you have to know that it is the ghost is subjectively real, not objectively. It is empty of hey, yeah. the ghost. You have to know that ghost is subjectively real. It is empty of objective, objective reality. reality. You have to know this. You're getting it. When will you know? You know this in the dream or when you wake up? When when will you know this? When you wake up. So therefore, you have to you have to know that if you do really want to get out of this fear, you have to wake up. Your name. Kavian. But Kavian said that we have to wake up. You're getting it? Okay. Now tell me, why when you wake up, the fear dissolves? Why in the dream you have the fear? Tell me, why? Why in the dream you have so much of fear? Why when you wake up, the fear dissolves? Why? 
Anyone? Wonderful. <laughs> wow, in just half an hour you understood empty the empty subject reality, right? Thank you. Okay. When you wake up, why the fear dissolves is you come to realize that the ghost who was bothering you was simply subject real. It is empty of objective reality. You agree with me? This is what the Buddha said. In other words, in the dream, why did you have the fear? Why did you have the fear in the dream? Tell me. We did not know it was We did not know that it was empty of objective reality. We believed that it was it was objectively real. Right? So this belief that the dream exists objectively real is that ignorance or this is wisdom? Hey, tell me. That believing in the dream, believing that this ghost is objectively real, is it ignorance? If I ask you now, is it ignorance or this is wisdom? No. This is ignorance. You're getting it? When you wake up, when you wake up, oh no, this ghost was just subjectively real. It was not objectively real. It is end of objective reality. That awareness is ignorance or wisdom? Wisdom. You're getting it? From this, what we've learned is that in the dream, why we had fear was because of the ignorance. When we wake up, why did we have the why did we have the relief of the fear? Why the fear dissolves was because of the wisdom. You're getting it? Okay, now tell me. Right? Tell me. What do you prefer? You prefer fear or the freedom free, freedom from fear? What do you want? <laughs> you want the freedom free. And who is that? Buddhist or non-Buddhist? Who is that? Who is that category? Who likes who who doesn't like fear? Who likes the freedom from fear? Who is that group? Buddhist or non-Buddhist? Huh? All oh, everyone. You are getting it. Whether you're Buddhist or not, everybody, nobody wants fear. Everybody wants the freedom of fear. If you want, whether you believe or not believer, if you whether you're Buddhist or not Buddhist, if you don't want fear, if you want the freedom from the fear, you have to wake up from the ignorance. And how to wake up from the ignorance? Ignorance is like darkness. Ignorance is like darkness. In dark, you don't know what is nearby. And then you may walk walk towards the wall, thinking that there's a door there, you bang against and you suffer because of the darkness. In dark, you don't see the reality. Ignorance stops you from seeing the reality. So therefore, ignorance is like darkness. And how to get rid of ignorance? This is a question. How to get rid of the ignorance? This is a question. You're getting it? So say, say, we are all having this PowerPoint presentation. And suddenly there's a power cut, right? Power cut, and you want to note down, note down what is being said, right? There's power cut. It is 12 midnight. Power cut, no light. Okay, so you want to make a very urgent note, empty of objective existence, right? Simply calling Gishila to say mantra or mani pema who doesn't help. I have to wake up from the sleep. You have to note it, note it down, but you cannot see this. So what do you do? And then you would, would you say prayer to the Buddha? Oh Buddha, please remove the darkness. Will you do, will you say the prayer? Or what will you do? The problem is the problem of the darkness. You don't have the, the light. The, the, there's a power cut. You want to write something, you cannot do it. Right? This is the problem. So what will you do? Would you say prayer to the Buddha? Buddha, please remove the darkness. Huh? Yes. If you say a prayer to the Buddha, right? Buddha, please remove the darkness. If the Buddha is sitting next to you, he will be very sad. He will think that what a stupid follower. <laughs> right? Why, why, why don't you go to light a candle? Right? Instead of saying prayer, right? And whereas, without saying prayer, if you light a candle, the Buddha would be so happy. Why? Right? This person is very smart. Smart girl or smart boy, right? He can understand my philosophy as well. So therefore, if you really want the, the darkness to be eradicated, you must introduce a light. Likewise, to remove the darkness of the ignorance, it is only to introduce the light of the wisdom. So therefore, the wisdom plays a very important role in Buddhism. Now, what is this wisdom? To wake us up from the sleep of ignorance. Number three, everything is the nature of emptiness and selflessness. This is so precious. So this is point number three. 
This is where we see the points of convergence between Buddhism and, and modern science, particularly quantum physics and relativity theory. Okay. Okay, let's see. The first picture is Niels Bohr, who is mainly credited for his contribution uh, to quantum physics. And the second picture, the, from the left to the right, is Niels Bohr. Then the third one is Albert Einstein. And Albert Einstein, who is mainly credited for his uh, theory, of relativity, theory of relativity. Okay, so these, these, two, these two concepts. Now, contemporary physics, contemporary physics is the determined is being driven by these two theories, quantum physics and the relativity theory. Okay, so the Buddha, so what the ultimate reality is, so we, to remove the darkness, remove the darkness of ignorance, we need to light the lamp of the wisdom. What is the wisdom? The wisdom is a, dis, wisdom is a discerning mind. Whose apprehension of the object tallies with reality? Let me say this again. What is your wisdom? To remove the darkness of ignorance, we have to introduce light of the wisdom. What is your wisdom? Wisdom is a discerning mind whose apprehension of the object tallies with reality. Wisdom is a discerning mind whose perception of the object tallies with the reality. What you see and the reality should correspond. Very good. Okay, if this is where I stop, what could be your next question? I said that the wisdom, to remove the darkness of ignorance, we have to introduce the light of the wisdom. And the light of the wisdom is the discerning mind whose apprehension of the object tallies with the reality. If this is what I say, what could be your next question? Anyone? How do we get this wisdom? Very good. Okay. Same. The same. The wisdom is the one which tallies with the reality. What is the reality? What is the reality? So the, the third the third seal, which the Buddha said. Everything is the nature of empty and selflessness. This is the reality. And the reality is something which quantum physics is exploring, which relativity theory is exploring what Buddhist, Buddhist philosophy is exploring. Okay. So the Buddha, Buddha, same. How many of you have been to Bodh Gaya? Raise hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Good. Okay. Say so under Bodh Gaya, under the Bodhi tree, the Buddha achieved enlightenment. Buddha achieved enlightenment. What was he doing exactly when he was when we achieved enlightenment? What what was he doing? He was he was igniting the light of the wisdom. He was igniting the light of the wisdom. You're getting it? So becoming enlightened, the job is to teach this reality to, to others. But the Buddha, after becoming enlightened, he did not teach for 49 days. He did not teach. So the kings of the gods and goddesses, celestial beings, kings of the two kings, Indra, Brahma, this sense that the Buddha Shakyamuni was here, this prince Siddhartha, he became enlightened and now he's not giving teachings. So the two kings of the gods and goddesses, they came down to make prostrations to the Buddha, made the request, please turn the wheel of Dharma, which means please give teachings, please teach the, the light of the wisdom to the beings. This was the request made. Then the Buddha said this stanza. Profound, peaceful, freedom of elaborations. Clear light, non-composite. Such a natural reality is what I found. Finding no one could, who can fathom this path. In silence, I'll return to the worlds. This is what the, the Buddha said. Then the Indra and Brahma, the kings of the celestial beings, they made more persuasions to go to Shakyamuni. And if you speak, don't remain silent, please turn to the Buddha. Okay. So from this what we realize is that ultimate reality. We talk about the wisdom. Wisdom is the one we see the reality. What's the reality? That reality the Buddha described as very profound. Very profound. And quantum physics is also talking about reality. Quantum physics, what is the presentation of reality according to quantum physics? 
So Niels Bohr, what he said is that if you study quantum physics and if you're not shocked by it, you have not understood quantum physics. If you study quantum physics and you are not shocked by it, you have not understood quantum physics. If you're not shocked. Which means that this quantum physics is so subtle, the reality which quantum physics explains is very subtle that you will you can't believe that this is the reality. You will be shocked. And the Buddha said, profound, peaceful, elaboration, clear light, non-composite, such a natural like reality, like reality is what I found. Finding no one who can fathom this path. This is very profound. People cannot fathom it very easily. So therefore, both the Buddha taught this reality is very profound, and Niels Bohr described the reality according to quantum physics is very profound. Okay, what is experience? If you realize that everything is like a dream, all coming subjectively real, nothing objectively, what is experience like? This is shared by Acharya Chandrakirti. He said, <coughs> upon, upon hearing about emptiness, even while being an ordinary person, whoever repeatedly gives rise to inner joy, and this joy bringing tears, moistening the eyes, and hairs to the body standing on end, in him is present the seed of wisdom of the perfect enlightenment. Okay, so this experience, when you get a tinge of this experience, right, of course, during the retreat, um, six days, six and, six and a half days, huh, Nico, how many days? Yes. Six and a half days, so there, uh, they, the retreat, we are discussing in detail about what, how everything is like dream, what are we seeing now? Okay, just look at the per other person sitting next to you. Look at the other person sitting next to you. Okay, I did not ask you to smile. <laughs> okay, look at the other person once more. Look at the other person once more. Look at the other person. To stop smiling, they are looking at me. Right? Don't look at me, look at somebody else. Okay, so tell me that when you look at that person, it makes you smile. Do you agree with me that the person who smiled, who made you smile, this person, the face made you smile, yes? yes. That's me, the face. Face is made of millions of atoms. How many of you agree with me? Yes. You all agree with me. Yes. Now imagine. Don't look at the other person, just see the other person as millions of atoms. Just think of the other person, the face as millions of atoms. Okay, how many of you are smi still smiling? Okay, no one is smiling. If you are smiling, it is time for you to go to mental hospital. <laughs> because atoms, there is nothing for you to smile at, right? Just seeing the atom still, if you smile, something is wrong with you. <laughs> but it's a reality, right? So on the one hand, you see the face of somebody. On the other, you see just a bunch of atoms. Both are reality. Both are reality, right? One makes you smile. One may, doesn't make you smile. You're getting it? So therefore, when you realize that everything is like that, just the millions of atoms, nothing is really there, this person and so forth, you see that everything is nothing but from the subject, from your mind. Nothing really from the object. It's just your mind which is playing a trick and creates all this appearance as from... What is it? What is that? Tower? Eiffel Tower. Eiffel Tower. Eiffel Tower. Right? Eiffel Tower. All this is just coming from your mind. Yeah, that's true. Right? It's just a bunch of atoms. No atom is a tower. Right? Okay. So this is something, if you realize this, if you realize this, it is like you waking up. You waking up from the sleep of ignorance. Okay. Okay, it's already nine o'clock. Okay, uh, never mind. From the left to the right, from the left to the right, 
From the, the left, you see something white there. This is the Big Bang in quantum physics. In physics, this is the starting point of the universe. The Big Bang started from what is known as the singularity, right? So this also quantum vacuum. So this point is described as the quantum vac vacuum, right? Quantum vacuum. And this quantum vacuum is the basis for all the phenomena that is coming out of that. Now, the Milky Way galaxies, the solar system, the, the, all the planets, and all the, the meteoroids, all the, the suns, the, the stars, everything came from this, what is known as the quantum vacuum. In Buddhist philosophy, everything came from this emptiness. Emptiness, vacuum, these two are similar. Right? Quantum vacuum. Quantum physics, they will say that it's not actually vacuum. In Buddhism, when I speak about emptiness, it is not actually, it is not actually total nothingness. It is not total nothingness. It has, there, it is a very subtle understanding by which quantum vacuum is not just a total vacuum. It's a, it, it, it describes of something what is known as the full of potentialities. So this is, again, a great similarity between the, the two, quantum physics and the relativity theory. So from there, from the left going towards the right, is in time, arrow of the time. So as we go from the left to right, we're going from the Big Bang, 15 billion years ago, till now, till now, till the end of the, the, uh, the, the right side, that is where we are now, in time. Okay, I think we will do this part, then the other the materials I will skip, because it's all nine o'clock. Okay, so, Emptiness. In quantum physics, we speak about a quantum vacuum. In Buddhism, what is known as the emptiness? What is emptiness? Right? Okay. How many of you learn about emptiness? Raise your hands. How many, how many of you learn about emptiness? Or at least how many of you have heard about emptiness? Raise your hands. Okay, good. <clears throat> this is very important point which I'd like to share with you. Emptiness. Dependent origination. These two are the two sides of the same coin. These are two sides of the same coin. Emptiness and dependent origination. Okay. So, emptiness, many people, even many professors, they interpret emptiness to mean nothingness. This is a total disaster. Emptiness doesn't mean nothingness. Emptiness is the meaning of dependent origination. And dependent origination is the meaning of the middle way. Okay, this is what we have to learn. Emptiness is the meaning of dependent origination, and dependent origination is the meaning of the middle way. Therefore, emptiness is not nothingness, emptiness is the middle way. Okay, this we have we have to get it. Let me say this again. Emptiness is the middle way. No, emptiness mean emptiness does not mean nothingness. Emptiness is the meaning of dependent origination. Dependent origination is the meaning of the middle way. Therefore, emptiness means the middle way. Right? Okay, now, what we're going to do before we close this, this, the talk, is that how emptiness means dependent origination. How? How dependent origination means the middle way. Right? So this is what we're going to learn here. Okay. Emptiness. Emptiness means the dependent origination. Emptiness. Emptiness. It does not mean nothingness. Okay. We have to know this with the help of five points. We, we have to know that emptiness and dependent origination these two be the same on the basis of five points. Oh, so what are the five points? This is so important. One emptiness. Emptiness, second point. Emptiness does not mean nothingness. Emptiness is the short form of emptiness of independent existence. Emptiness of short form of emptiness of independent existence. Okay, those of you who speak English, I don't know whether you want to put some of that in French. Those of you who speak English, then they are telling me how many of you know who? Those of you who speak English, who know, tell me. Those, those of you who know, who know English, tell me what do you mean by who? Ah, who? Que veut dire uh, qui? Huh? Qui? Qui? No, you don't know. <laughs> who? W H O. Yeah. Qui? Qui? Qui comprend en anglais? Huh? Veut dire, on veut dire. What is W H O? Qui? <laughs> what is W H O? No understanding. <laughs> what is W H O? 
world, world, hell. Ah, c'est la chronique pour l'OMS. Oui, c'est pour l'OMS. Ah, c'est la chronique pour l'OMS. Oui, ok. Donc, c'est who In English, who are you What is your who In French, what is who On dit qui 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 Ok. This who, W-H-O, this is not key. Who, en anglais, ne veut pas dire qui. It means, world, health, organization. It's a short form of world, health, organization. Don't understand it as key. If you have stood that, world health organization. This is a short form of world health organization. Likewise, emptiness, government nothingness, is a short form of emptiness of independent existence. Number two. Number one is emptiness. Number two is what? It's a short form of emptiness of independent existence. Number two. Number three. Emptiness of independent existence means nothing exists independently. Emptiness of independent existence means number three. Nothing exists independently. You're getting it? Nothing exists independently means tell me. Nothing exists independently means everything exists by dependent. Number four is emptiness. And number four is number three is what? Nothing exists independently. When you say nothing exists independently. Number four, it means everything exists by dependence. This is number four. Everything exists by dependence means number four. Number five, everything exists by dependence means everything is dependently originated. Right? So therefore, from this reasoning, we come to know that emptiness is not nothingness. Emptiness is the meaning of dependent origination. Okay, this is what the part one. Part two. Dependent origination is the meaning of the middle way. How? How can we know that dependent origination is the middle way? This is very important. Okay. Dependent origination, do you agree with me or not? Dependent origination has two sides. Dependence and origination. You agree with me? Very good. Okay, the first one, dependence. When we say dependence, what is the opposite of dependence? Independence. When you say Dependence, you reject independence. Right? Independence and absolutism mean the same. So when you say dependence, origination, dependence, you reject the extreme of dependence, independence, you reject the extreme of absolutism, dependence. What's the other side? Origination. Origination. Origination means something comes into origination, something comes into existence. What's the opposite of existence? Non What's the opposite of existence? Non-existence, non right? When you say origination, reject, you reject non-existence. Non-existence and nihilism mean the same. So when you say origination, you reject the extreme of nihilism, right? Dependence, you reject the extreme of absolutism. Origination, you reject the extreme of nihilism. So when you bring these two together, dependent origination, you reject the two extremes. Rejecting the two extremes is following the hey. Rejecting the two extremes is following the middle way. So therefore, dependent origination is the meaning of the middle way. You're getting it? So from this, what we have learned is emptiness doesn't mean nothingness. Emptiness is the meaning of dependent origination. And dependent origination doesn't mean nothingness, is the meaning of the middle way. So by default, emptiness is the meaning of middle way, not nihilism. Okay, now, having understood emptiness to mean dependent origination, we need to know that dependent origination has three levels. One is dependent origination of causation. Number two is dependent origination of whole and parts. Number three is dependent origination of mere mental designation. Right? Okay. Now, if you come to know these three levels of dependent origination, your life is going to be very easy. Right? All the unnecessary stress of life will drop if you know these three levels of dependent origination so well. Okay, one, dependent origination of causation, meaning that anything which is a result should come into being by dependence on their causes. By dependence on causes, 
the results come into origination, come into being. One. Right? Okay. If you want, if you want, say, good things, good effects, happiness, happiness is the result of the corresponding cause. You have to embrace the, the cause which is, the cause which is your thinking. Your thinking as a cause, responsible for giving rise to happiness, we call it virtues. So by dependence on the virtues as the causes, then the happiness will originate, dependent origination, number one. Number two, what number two? Dependent origination holds and the parts. Say for example, say I, this person, this person I, this person I is a person as a whole, as a whole. So this person comes into being as, as a compassionate person or an uncompa non-compassionate person, <coughs> unkind person, or a kind person, depending on its mind. You agree with me? If the mind is compassionate, we say the person is kind. If the mind is unkind, we say the person is very unkind. So, that the person is kind, not kind, the whole person. Person as a whole, whether the person is kind, not kind, is determined by the whole, the, the parts. Mind as a part. And whether the person is a male or a female, is determined by the body. Again, as a part. So, the whole is determined by the part. Whether the house is beautiful or not beautiful, that depends on the parts. If all the parts are beautiful, we say that the house is beautiful. You're getting it? So we see that the whole is nothing but composed of parts. It is by dependence on the parts that the whole came into origination. Number three. Number two. Number three. Dependent on origination of mere mental designation. Okay, this number three is very important. That Everything that comes in, for example, say the dream. Say, you dream of you dream of, dream of being in India, flying to India. Actually, you and you bet, and you in your in your dream you are busy buying a ticket, France airline, <laughs> right? And then you get a ticket, and then you go to Delhi. From Delhi again, you take a bus or a train or a flight. To India, no, to, to Dharamsala, then you take a car, and then the next day you have the audience with this one, right? So all these are just your dream, right? All these are your dream. Yet, the dream dictates your emotional states. You, are, you agree with me? The dream dictates your emotions, whether you are happy, unhappy in the dream, they are all determined by the content of the dreams. So, when you wake up, you realize that everything that happened in the dream, they are all just coming from your mind. You agree with me or not? Coming from mind meaning mental destination. Beyond your mental destination, nothing was there as a dream. Nothing was there as real in the dream. Everything. You see, just in the dream, you just go along the, the path. You see a tiny flower there. Even that flower is also mental, your mental destination. Right? Nothing is there in your dream which was not your mental destination. Everything in the dream came from your mental destination. The moment you realize that is all subject to real, coming from your mind, nothing from the object, all your fears dissolve. All your fears dissolve. Whereas the moment you realize, the moment you think that all the dream is so real, not coming from your mind, it's so real, then all the fears dwell from it. If you see things as mental destination, your fears dissolve. If you believe that things are not mentally designated, it's all objective real, your all fears arise. So therefore, wise person, sound of a clam. If you don't want the sound of a clam, of the two, which is wiser? To remove the external fa factors or to remove the internal factor, which is wiser? To remove the internal factor is wiser. So what is that internal factor? Finally, it is the ignorance to see things as objectively real. Right? How to get rid of this ignorance? How to get rid of this metal factor? It is by introducing wisdom. Which wisdom? The wisdom to know that everything is like a dream. Right? Okay. And if you want to know more, how can I exactly know that everything is like a dream? Come for the retreat. Right? Okay. So the, there are several materials, but I don't want to take it too long. It's already 9.15. Okay, so relative space, relative space of time. Interesting. All these very interesting topics. Maybe next year.
brain versus what is the difference with the brain and the mind. This we had a the extensive discussion earlier in some somebody's the, the plays. And then the the what is the Charles Darwin's view on the brain and mind relationship? Okay, these are very interesting things. And the vision of his holiness, the Dalai Lama. Okay, so this I may quickly touch, explain to you. And so his holiness Wherever he travels, people ask him one question. Modern education is meant to give rise to, to give rise to the greater harmony, happiness of the world. But in actuality, the, the state of the world is going down. The plot of the world, the happiness world is going down. While the modern education is climbing to such height of development. So where are we going wrong? This is a question asked to his holiness by many of the experts, social workers, medical experts, environmentalists, the educationists, the economists, all these people, they ask this question. So he only says that it's all because there is one mistake in the modern education system. There's one mistake in the modern education system. It emphasizes so much on the material, materialism. It does not focus on the internal world of the mental state. It doesn't teach the student, it doesn't teach the children how to take care of one's emotions, how to take care of one's mind. It only talks about how to take care of the material world, right? So, the modern education is designed in such a way that if a child says 2 plus 3 equals 5, wow, you're good, you pass. If you say 2 plus 3 equals 5-ish, you <laughs> fail. This is modern education. Even if you have a capacity 2 plus 3 equals somewhat 5, 5-ish, five right? Then you fail. Even if you can become, you have the capacity to become the second Maha, the second, the Martin Luther King Jr. Or you can become the, the Mahatma, second Mahatma Gandhi. Still, you will not be accounted for. You are just discounted. Right? Okay. So this is where he says, that now in this world, Irrespective of what religion that you're following, right? We need to we need to teach the youngsters what is known as universal ethics for the well-being of the world. Universal ethics, ethics designed, not necessarily attached with any religion, because the moment we say religion, His Holiness says that of the seven billion human beings, of the seven billion human beings, essentially. Superficially, people believe in religion, but in the actual real life, they don't believe in religion, right? Say, usually, the, the you say all the temples, churches, and the, these places they are used as a business transaction, right? People pray, people give donation, ten euro, five euro. Please, please give me good business. So there's a transaction going there, right? So whereas his own saying is that these are not the genuine practitioners, right? Essentially, out of seven billion human beings, majority are non-believer in that sense. Because they are non-believer in that sense, we need to we need to introduce ethics, a form of ethics which is universal in nature, universal whether one is a believer, whether one is non-believer, everybody would say. Yes, I want happiness and with this ethics, which is universal nature, that makes sense. I'll embrace it. This is something which we have to introduce to the modern education. It must be done in the form of a modern education. So this is a massive project which His Holiness has started. And it is actually uh, for the well-being of the humanity. Not for the Buddhists, not for the Tibetans, it's for the humanity. That the world is going through a huge, massive crisis. Crisis, gender discrimination. Gap in rich and poor, corruption, terrorism, and all, of, for example, in the, the Western countries, for example, in America, the gun shooting in the schools, all these things are happening because of lack of what is known as ethics, feeling of love and affection towards the co fellows, co women beings. Right? So, this is what his soulness is emphasizes so much to bring this to light in this today's world. Okay, so any questions? Any question that you might have, it doesn't mean that I've all 
answers any question that you might have i'll be very happy right and the, the questions which i cannot give the answers to so this is going to be like a food for for me to take home for my own reflection right okay any questions Please don't prove me right, which I already told the Nico before. <laughs> please don't be, prove me right. Sure. Any question? Please raise hands. Yes. Uh, we did a question. I can imagine you put it aside. It's difficult for me. Uh, every time I hear this word composite. Uh, yeah. Composite. Composite. Yes. I think about my city, Rotterdam, in the Netherlands. And I think composite in this Buddhist context is something negative. And in Rotterdam, there are 110 nationalities speaking 70 languages. So, I, in my opinion, maybe I'm mistaken, it's a composite side of all kinds of things from all over the world. And that should be a positive thing. So, how should I read? the word composite in this context. Okay, so composite here... Composite here does not really mean... Um, it has nothing to... it is not at all... The first one, all composite things are impermanent. Yeah. This, or, this is not at all negative. Composite... Even the Buddha's body is also composite phenomena. Even the Buddha's mind is also composite phenomena, which is the highest virtue. Right? Even now, the, the, the Buddha nature, Buddha nature which is going to grow, do eventually flourish in the Buddhahood, that is also a composite phenomena. So we see that composite is not necessarily negative. Any questions? Okay, if not, we'll stop here. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Venerable Elizabeth Love. Thank you, Venerable here, Nico. Then um, the Kabasin and all. Each one of you, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so we will what? Do a dedication prayer. A quick one sentence dedication prayer. Nyodo da Sanye. Rimbo <laughs> Hare Rave Korve Shikamsu, Enda Deva Madhu Chujo, Shere Zimwa Tenze Kya Soye, Shabe Sikhe Pandu Tengiro Ishi. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.